All right. Welcome to the final session of the Ceph Day track here at uh, Open Source Days. Go ahead and take your seat. We're going to get started. Uh, just a reminder, if you do have questions either in the middle or at the end, to make sure you use the microphones so that the recording that we have going for posterity will, uh, will pick you up, as well as the rest of us in the room. Uh, our, our next and final speaker uh, is the creator and current uh, project lead for Ceph, uh, Sage Weil. And he's going to talk about some of the more recent work that's been going into uh, the upcoming release of Luminous uh, and a few other things that we have going on. So, Sage? Thanks. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. All right. My name is Sage Weil. I'm the Ceph project lead. I work at Red Hat in the Office of Technology and oversee Ceph development and so on. So I'm going to talk a bit about um, the release that's about to come out, Luminous, um, what's in it, what's cool. And then I'm going to talk about what we're working on after that. Um, and then a bit about contributor stats and so on. Um, so just a level set, um, Ceph does a regular release cadence. We do, um, normally we do releases every six months. Every other one is an LTS, which means we do backports for bug fixes and so on. Luminous is about to come out. It's supposed to be spring. It's going to sort of be another month or two before it's out, so it'll be, I guess, early summer. We're a little bit behind. Um, the next release after that is going to be Mimic, um, which will be a non-LTS in the fall or maybe winter if we continue our sort of laggard pace. And then the one after that will be the end release, probably Nautilus, but the name isn't really finalized yet. Um, they're, they're all names of cephalopods, and they go by letters increasing. So Luminous is Luminous Squid, which is Beautiful, <laughs> if you go look at Google, Google Images, and wonderful, and so on. So lots of good stuff coming in Luminous. Um, it's going to be a really good release. I'm very excited about it. Um, the biggest one, the biggest piece that um, I'm most excited about, because I worked on it primarily, was Blue Store. Blue Store is going to be stable in Luminous, and it's going to be the default backend for the OSDs. So it's a big, big milestone. Um, Blue Store consumes a raw block device in contrast to our sort of legacy file store, which consumes XFS. Um, we use RocksDB internally for metadata, um, but it's all sort of packaged up, one big thing that we control. Um, it's very fast on hard disks, roughly twice as fast, both for large IOs and small IOs. For regular SSDs, it's also faster than file store, uh, maybe more like one and a half times, but it, it varies on your workload. Um, for NVMe, um, it isn't that different than file store. Um, because the NVMe isn't actually the slow part. We have other issues to deal with optimizing Ceph itself, so it uses less CPU. Um, but Blue Store is the future, and that's, that's sort of where we're trying to get, get to. More importantly, it sort of gets rid of all this legacy stuff that we had with File Store. So all these weird performance anomalies that you wouldn't notice until you had strange workloads sort of go away because we are less stupid, mostly. So uh, Blue Store has uh, full data checksums on everything. So every time you read any data from the disk, it gets Check some verified so you won't get sort of um, bad errors. Um, it also does inline compression with ZLub or Snappy, um, which is nice, and it's, it's going to be the stable thing. Lots of people contributed to it um, as a group effort, and, and we're very excited to finally have it done and out there. I'm going to show a few quick performance plots. Um, these are showing large and small um, write IOs, random writes, on uh, showing throughput and latency. Um, but the whole bunch of development branches, sort of the top one is the one that um, all got merged. These are a little bit old. Um, but it's roughly twice as fast for large and small IO, is sort of the takeaway. Same thing, similar picture when you mix reads and writes. Um, the reads aren't necessarily twice as fast, so it's a, a bit of a blend there. Um, but more importantly, if you look at sort of the, the aggregate workload, not just sort of a, a micro benchmark, um, things like Rados Gateway that are doing index updates on the bucket in indices that are stored in Rados, um, there were all these weird, annoying things that File Store had to do in order to make that work properly and be consistent and safe. Um, Blue Store does it much better, and so the performance improvement is more like 3x or 4x, depending on what your workload is, um, because the it just isn't as dumb as it used to be. So um, we're very excited about that. Um, and as a consequence of all that, this also enabled us to do another big feature, which is um, erasure code support for Rados block device, finally. Um, so the, the key missing piece before was um, erasure coded pools didn't support overwrites of existing data. Now they do, so you can put a block device on top of those objects. Um, it requires a blue store in order to perform because we have to do a two-phase commit with efficient to be able to roll back. Um, and that it's implemented on file store, but it's horrifically slow. Um, and the other thing is that um, we rely on the checksums in Blue Store in order to do the deep scrubbing. 
Um, and so if you're using file store with the EC overwrites, you can't deep scrub. It doesn't actually verify anything unless you just go read the data. Um, so blue store and EC overwrites sort of go together um, in Luminous. So it's there, it's good. Um, it's a significant improvement in efficiency over 3x replication. Um, even if you use a very narrow code, like a 2 plus 2 or a 4 plus 2, um, it's like a factor of 2x or 50% cost improvement, much less storage that you have to buy. Um, it's not perfect, though. Uh, with an erasure code, small writes are slower because you have to operate more, update more devices when you update a full stripe um, with the erasure code. Um, hopefully, we hope to mitigate that with Blue Store, although we haven't done sort of the final testing that pits File Store 3x against Blue Store erasure coded. So that's sort of in progress. So we'll sort of know what the final, how we, how we net out. Um, but on the flip side, large writes are actually faster than replication because you're actually doing less I.O. Um, to your devices. Um, which is also good. The implementation is still doing sort of the simple thing. Um, when you do a small write, it's updating a full stripe. Um, so we, we want to do things that are more clever, but it's going to take a little bit more time before we are able to make those optimizations. Um, but it works in Luminous. It's there. It's ready to, ready to go. Um, the other big piece of, of work that went into Luminous was the new Ceph Manager daemon. Um, it actually appeared in Kraken, but didn't actually do anything useful yet. In um, Luminous, it does lots of useful things. Um, the main thing is that it offloads a whole bunch of work that the monitor used to do um, into a new daemon. So the monitor previously dealt with all the PG stats. It ended up with a whole bunch of data that was just churning through Paxos and slowing down the monitor and limiting our overall scalability. Um, that's all gone. Manager is doing it instead. It um, doesn't have any durable state, and so it's much faster and more efficient. And monitor can focus just on the things that are important for keeping your cluster up and consistent and, and storing data. Um, so it's going to make Cephmon scale again. Um, and coincidentally, this morning I just got word that CERN um, has uh, like a 10,000 OSD um, cluster that we're going to be able to use for two weeks in a couple of weeks to do another Ceph scale test. Um, and so it's perfectly timed to test all this new Luminous stuff to actually see how it does um, with these big, because we don't usually get to buy that much hardware at Red Hat, unfortunately. Um, so that's, that's going to happen in the next couple of weeks. Very excited about that. Um, Ceph Manager also has a new REST API. Um, we sort of took the Calamar API, adapted it. It uses the Pecan framework now. It's written in Python. Manager has this nice Python plugin framework that you can use. So that's going to be there. Um, and there's also going to be a built-in dashboard. It's super simple. It's basically like a Ceph-S on the web. Um, but it works. Um, here's a screenshot. It's, it's pretty simplistic right now. This is a one OSD cluster on my laptop, so it doesn't really show much interesting. But it shows you know, all your demons, all your health warnings, whether things health is good or bad. It shows the log. Um, just really basic stuff like that. Um, so not much in Luminous yet, but this is going to be a building block moving forward. Eventually, we're going to add all the, all the metrics in there that the manager already has. Actually, it just doesn't present them through the GUI um, and that sort of thing. So moving forward there. Um, there's a new network messenger implementation in Luminous. Um, it actually was new in Kraken, um, but it's Luminous or Joule. It's new since Joule. Um, new implementation. It doesn't use up lots of threads. It's much more efficient. It's event driven. Um, it's a fresh code base. It's great. It's so much better. <laughs> um, it also has a pluggable backend. So there's an RDMA backend for the messenger um, that is uh, built by default. It isn't tested very heavily, but I don't have any RDMA. Um, gear in our, in our community lab. Um, but it's being used in a few places in production um, with good results. So it seems stable, um, but it's not sort of officially supported and tested yet. So um, your mileage may vary. Um, there's also an experimental DBTK backend that uses Intel's um, user space acceleration library stuff. Um, that also looks very promising. It's, it's definitely in the prototype stage. It's not ready to, to go, but um, the code's there, and it, you, know, you can build it and play with it if you want. Um, so very excited there. Mellanox has been an ex guy have been the main people working on the, the RDMA stuff. Um, and the other sort of nice thing that's coming in Joule is that we're finally going to have perfectly balanced OSDs. Um, so any, everybody who operates a large cluster is dealing with the variation between the least utilized OSD and the most utilized OSD and dealing with reweights and capacity planning. And it's just it's a headache. Um, we finally have a bunch of new tools to actually make that essentially a perfect balance. Um, so the two, two tools are something called ShoeZargs for Crush, which basically is sort of a, a way to feed in all the specific parameters for a particular pool that tweak the weights and the ID so you can sort of get it to do exactly what you want. It's sort of a generic capability, but what it allows us to do is run a numeric optimization that just um, does a gradient descent and fiddles with all the weights to op so you actually get the actual output is exactly what the weights are that you intended when you put it in. 
Um, so it solves that imbalance problem. Um, it also addresses, addresses something that we've been calling the multi-pick anomaly, although it's a very imprecise mathematical term. Um, but it basically is an issue with the way that um, the underlying mathematics of probability that Crush is based on, um, where if you have a device that has a very low weight and a bunch of things that have larger weights, for example, if you have a bunch of racks and you start a new rack with one server in it, um, Crush tends to put too much data on those devices and overflow them. Um, and this, it's, it's, a, it's annoying math. <laughs> we didn't even notice it for a long time. Um, but we can, act, we can correct for that as well by using adjusted probabilities for the second and third replica choices in Crush. Um, so the good news is that the imbalance portion of that, optimizing for that, is actually going to be backwards compatible with older clients. Um, if you want to correct for the multi-pick part, then you have to wait until all your clients are running Luminous and understand the new stuff. The other tool is something called PGUpMap, which is just like, um, it's just the ability to put an explicit exception mapping in the OSD map that, that says this PG is stored on these OSDs, period. Um, so it just overrides whatever Crush says and says, put it here. And so there's a really simple optimizer that looks at your distribution and says, this OSD has one PG too many and this one has one too few, so I'm just going to move it there um, and, and does that. Um, so both those tools are there, um, but the PG map also requires luminous clients, so you won't really be able to use it in a production cluster until everybody's upgraded on the client side. And a few other odds and ends um, for the radio side. Um, Crush has something new called device classes, where you can just tag the OSDs in your system as being a particular class or type. So you can say these are SSDs, these are hard disks, these are NVMEs. Um, and then you can write a crush rule that's just really simple that says map to OSD, or OSDs that are SSDs and map to hard disks. Um, previously, if you wanted to do this, you had to create, you had to manually edit your crush map and create two parallel hierarchies and futz with all the names and all the automatic crush manipulation stuff just kind of broke. Super tedious. Now it, it works out of the box. It's really simple. Um, so that's nice. Um, there's a streamlined disk replacement process that's well documented. So Ceph disk, you can replace OSDs for using the same IDs and it's going to be simple and <laughs> it's actually going to work. Um, so that'll be nice. There's a new configure option that lets you, as an administrator, just declare what the oldest client version is that you want to support. And then the monitor will sort of gate um, all of the other things that manipulate crush tunables and so forth so you don't screw up. Um, so you can just say, I want to be able to compatible, be compatible with Hammer clients. And you tell the cluster that, and it'll just prevent you from doing anything that would break, break that constraint, um, just to make operators' lives a little bit easier. Um, we're annotating and documenting all the config options in the code, so you can just do a dump and see all the config options, what they mean, and what, whether you should touch them or not. They'll be marked as like experimental, developer-only, do not touch, versus something that you should adjust, expert-only, that sort of thing. Um, there's a mechanism so that if um, a PG or an object is stuck, then there's a back-off mechanism, so the clients will stop sending requests, um, which in certain recovery situations can bite people in the, in the whatever, so that they can't actually talk to their OSD. So there's some things like that that are fixed for having better EIO handling, um, peering and recovery speed ups, um, new in Kraken actually, um, but new since Joule. Um, Ceph is now, in most cases, if an OSD fails, it immediately notices. You don't have to wait for a heartbeat timeout. Um, so it's much faster failure detection and, and cluster moves on. So um, lots of good stuff. That's, there's an ongoing list of just sort of random little robustness stuff um, that's improving. So. Uh, good things there. I'm sort of moving out of Rados into the Rados gateway. Um, we sort of have this high level view um, that in the future, most data is going to be stored in object stores. Um, so while block is obviously very important, particularly for cloud workloads and hosting VMs, that's not actually where most of the data is going to be. Most of it's going to end up in objects like S3 and Swift APIs. Um, and so there's a whole raft of features that we're looking at here, things like erasure coding, tiering, multi-site federation, and so on. Um, so new and luminous, um, sort of the biggest new thing that's most exciting is um, Rados Gateway Metadata Search. Um, so we already have this mechanism, my build's kind of screwed up here, um, this mechanism where you can take Ceph clusters and multiple data centers, or the same data center, but you can um, have multiple zones, sort of um, quasi-independent um, RGW installations um, that are federated with each other. So they share a bucket namespace and user, and you can put a bucket in a particular zone. You can replicate across zones. You can do all this stuff with the new federation, active, active, all kinds of stuff. Um, but the mechanism that allows that, that does actually the syncing, is pretty pluggable. And so we have a plugin 
that does um, syncing of just metadata and it dumps it all into Elasticsearch. And then there's a new set of APIs in the Rados gateway that are um, search APIs that go query Elasticsearch. So if you set up one of these zones to index your object gateway content, you can have it index either the default stuff or whatever headers you, you care about. Then you can go do search queries to find out what you're storing, you know, what file types, what headers they're setting, whatever you want to do. Um, so that's exciting and totally new. Um, a bunch of other stuff um, with the Rados gateway. Um, there's a, a new NFS gateway. Um, it's actually been present in some versions of, of Joule. It got backported to some of the downstream stuff. I can't remember if actually if it, was, if it was upstream before. But this is for the Rados gateway. There's a very simple NFS gateway that lets you mount NFS v4, v3 to copy in data or copy out data, which is great for migrating existing workloads from sort of file-based storage systems to object as you make that transition. Um, it's not meant to be a full POSIX file system. It doesn't do small writes and renames and truncates and all that random crap. Um, but for just copying data in and out, it, it works great. Um, so that's, that's big for a lot of users. Um, sort of the biggest um, management operations headache that we are resolving is um, dynamic bucket index sharding. Um, so for RGW users, um, the bucket indexes, if you put too many objects in a bucket, the index would get big. And there was a tool that you could do offline that would reshard it. Or if you created a bucket, you could declare, decide what the sharding was up front. But it was kind of a headache, and you had to plan ahead, and it wasn't very friendly. Finally, in Luminous, that's just going to be automatic. Um, so as the bucket gets big, it will reshard on its own. And you won't have to do anything. It'll happen online. It'll just not be something you have to worry about. Just sort of, you might, there's a bit of a theme of not having to worry about annoying things that we're trying to um, chip away at these things. So, so that's good. Um, there are also a, a couple other sort of headline features um, that came into the gateway um, uh, through a team of Mirantis, did a, a bunch of great work. There's inline compression. Um, so RGW will compress the data as it comes into the cluster and write that compressed data to, to Rados. Um, so, uh, that's good um, and sort of happens transparently. There's also a bunch of encryption APIs that were implemented. These are following the S3 encryption APIs. I can't remember what the name of that the whole category is, but you can set um, keys on the buckets, on the users. It's a whole bunch of, it's a big complicated API that Amazon made up. Um, we basically implemented it. Um, so it's there. Um, yep. Uh, and then there's just a whole bunch of stuff with the S3 and Swift APIs that's been improved and added and updated. And there's sort of always a constant flow of, um, of issues there that get resolved. Um, those are sort of the big, exciting things on the Rados gateway side. On the Rados block device, um, also lots of stuff going on. The biggest thing, obviously, is erasure coding, which I already mentioned. But I'm going to mention it again because it's a big deal. You can run Rados block devices on an erasure coded pool and buy less hard disks and SSDs and everything else. So um, it's pretty simple. You just specify the data pool when you're creating the RBD block device. Um, and it puts just the data blocks in that, in that pool. Um, there's also a lot of work went into the RBD mirroring mechanism. So the RBD mirroring demons are now, mul there are multiple ones of them. And they're sharing the load. And they're HA and all that stuff. Whereas in Joule, there, it, would, it existed, but it was just one demon. Now it's a bunch of them. And they scale out and all that, all that stuff. So lots of stuff there. Uh, mostly just around robustness and not so much around new feature capabilities. Um, improved sender integration always is ongoing stuff in OpenStack. Um, a lot of work going into iSCSI. Um, this has sort of been a multi-year journey of various false starts and attempts to use different kernel interfaces that get tanked by upstream kernel, whatever. Um, but the final, the new, the latest um, iSCSI approach is based on LAO's TCMU runner. Um, which is basically a user space pass through. So the iSCSI kernel target in the kernel is going to pass through to user space to librbd, um, which is nice because you get the full LLRBD feature set, um, the latest and the greatest there. Um, and the performance penalty of doing that pass through is, is very modest, actually. So that's good. Um, and it's going to be a full HA solution that does failover and SCSI reservations and active act, all that stuff. Um, so that's, that's coming. Um, and on the kernel side, um, there have been lots of RBD improvements, um, keeping up with the crush and OSD and cluster protocol changes that have happened. Um, um, that's all there. Um, RBD specifically, the exclusive locking stuff is in the kernel now upstream, and support for the object map stuff, which are both kind of old features, but they're now in the kernel. So if you're using the native kernel block device, you can get that stuff. Um, and finally, CephFS. So if you've seen in my talks in the last few years, or last year, I guess you've seen this before, but we used to talk about CephFS and Ceph, saying that all these parts of Ceph were awesome, but CephFS was nearly awesome because it wasn't ready yet, and yada, yada. And finally, now, CephFS is production ready. It's stable. It is now fully awesome. Um, yay. Um, so I said, 
I said exactly the same thing at the OpenStack talk six months ago, except it said 2016 instead of 2017. The new, the latest fully awesome part that is now fully awesome <laughs> is that um, Luminous will have support for multiple MDSs, active active, which also has been a long time coming and is finally there. So yeah, yeah. Oh, hopefully not long ago. All right, let me see if I can catch up. I blame Fedora. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Okay, there we go. Um, yes, so multiple active MDSs, finally. Um, and there's um, a bunch of stuff to go along with that. So the multiple MDSs have this load balancing framework that's all heuristic based and it tries to understand your workload and move things around, but it's hard to understand what client workloads are doing. So there's also this manual mechanism so you can just go in and say this subtree, this directory, I'm just going to pin it to that MDS. So um, if you want to, you can just manually just enforce whatever the subtree partition is that you want if you don't want to rely on the automatic thing to do its thing, which it might do right, it might do wrong. It's, it's sort of ongoing work. Um, so there's that. Um, directory fragmentation is finally on by default. Um, this is CephFS dealing with very large directories. It'll break them up into little pieces and put them in separate objects and multiple MDSs and all that stuff. Um, it was off by default for a long time just because we didn't have the test coverage. It's finally on, so that's good. There's been so many tests written and so many bugs fixed. It's just that the CephFS team has just been kicking their butts, um, really getting confidence in the stability and so forth. So that's all there. And a lot of work also going in on the, on the kernel client side. Um, also keeping the kernel client up to date with all the changes in user space and improve fixing bugs and so on. So group effort here, mostly from Red Hat and SUSE developers, um, but it's been, it's been good. So we're really excited about CephFS. Yay. Um, and I, if you saw the user survey also, you might have seen that um, the Manila CephFS driver is like hugely popular, number one. Yeah, which, that's pretty cool. So um, yay, yay open source. Um, so that's, that's mostly it for all the stuff that's coming in Luminous. Um, uh, we're, we're sort of wrapping up the development cycle um, as we sort of, there are a couple of last features that we're, we're finalizing and getting merged into the tree. Um, and in the meantime, we're also focusing on what sort of the low hanging fruit for just usability and making things easier to manage and deal with and less confusing that we can squeeze into the release. Cause that's sort of, you might've noticed there's a bit of a theme of trying to make Ceph less hard. Um, and so we're trying to get as much of that in Luminous as we can. Um, but then after Luminous, there's more stuff. So what's, what's coming next? The next release is going to be Mimic. It's named after the Mimic Opt Octopus. I strongly encourage all of you to Google Mimic Octopus on YouTube and look at them. They're like super, super amazing. It's the, definitely the coolest cephalopod I've Googled. <laughs> um, they're awesome. Anyway, so Mimic, lots of stuff. Again, the sort of the, the sort of the highest, the main motivation, I'd say the main priorities are like, you know, make stuff faster performance. Um, um, but mostly of, uh, for, as far as features, we we're, we're, feel like we're in pretty good position. The main challenge I think that a lot of OpenStack users are facing, or not OpenStack, Ceph users are facing is um, around usability. It's just hard to manage, it's complicated, it's hard to set up. And so we're just trying to make it easier um, and less confusing. And a lot of it, um, yeah, there's a lot of stuff that we can do that just is sort of needlessly obtuse and <laughs> opaque. Um, so we're trying to, trying to improve that. Um, but there's also performance is a big thing too. So on the Rados side, the biggest thing that's going to happen post Luminous is we have sort of a big refactor cleanup optimization exercise planned. Um, so there's some peering stuff that we want to fix up. But the main thing is that the main I.O. path where messages come in and they get processed within the thread pool and then they get handed off to the objects, whatever, it needs to be refactored, cleaned up, restructured um, to use more asynchronous, state-driven um, model for programming. We're probably gonna use you know, features and all these fancy language features and whatever, but it's gonna be painful, but it's, it's really important because the current structure of the code is hard to maintain because it's gotten so complicated and it doesn't perform as well as it needs to. Um, so as our storage devices get faster and faster, we really need to address this sort of elephant in the room in order to, to make progress. Um, so that's gonna happen. Um, ongoing work in BlueFS um, and Rocks v2. Um, there are some sort of tactical items that we're dealing with there, but really we're limited by that OSD piece. We've done a lot of optimization on the messenger side. Um, you saw the talks earlier with RDMA and so on. That's getting much, much faster, getting stuff into and out of Ceph, and Blue Store is much, much better um, at getting stuff on disk and off disk. We sort of eliminated the main issues there, but it's really everything in between um, that needs to be fixed up. So, um, so that's the big thing. That's gonna keep at least some piece of our team 
pretty busy. Um, but there's uh, some other exciting uh, rate of stuff that's coming too. So one of the efforts that's been going on for quite a while now, but sort of has been sort of a, a secondary priority, has been working on quality of service. Um, this ongoing background development around the DM clock algorithm that was published several years ago in an academic conference. It's distributed quality of service um, that gives you two things. You can give uh, minimum reservations to clients or classes of clients, and you can do um, priority-based waiting um, for everything above that. So you can guarantee so many IOs to certain clients, and then whatever's left over will be proportionally shared with weights among the other clients. Um, and the idea is to have a range of policies. So we can use this just to prioritize types of traffic, like client IO versus recovery IO. Um, we can prioritize pools so that certain pools will get more, be faster than other pools on the same OSD. Um, or just do it based on client, so that this client gets a minimum reservation and this one gets whatever's left over. Um, but the problem is it's, it's just a complicated problem, especially when you talk about distributed systems and things that replicate, so you're actually signing up to do I.O. on other people's nodes. Um, it's complicated. Um, but despite that, um, our initial testing has actually shown pretty good results. So we're encouraged that um, despite not having sort of a complete <laughs> solution necessarily, it's actually, it actually seems to be working pretty well. Um, the main thing missing right now is really having any kind of management framework. So we have a lot of the underlying queuing stuff done, but we don't know how it's going to be configured and how, what the user experience is going to look at. That's sort of all work TBD. Um, but the initial results are promising. So this is, a, this is an example of a test run um, a month or two got back where you have a couple clients that have minimum um, IOPS reservations of 100 or you know, 50 and 100 IOPS. And then the third one had a, a, a very high priority. So everything that was left over beyond that ended up given to the third client and not the first two. Um, and you can see that it actually you know, does what it says it's supposed to do. Um, so, so that's exciting. Um, we're sort of getting pieces of that merged and it's sort of coming together, but um, it, it'll probably be a couple of releases before it's actually a complete usable thing. The other thing that's going on is there's more work in the tiering department. Um, so once upon a time we did this thing called cache tiering and it, and it worked okay, but not great. Um, and so we sort of stopped talking about it and doing much with it. Um, this, the new tiering stuff um, is, is coming and it's, um, it's based on some pretty simple primitives. So the basic idea is the a concept of a, a redirect. So you can have a Rados object that's basically a symlink to another lob object. But from the client's perspective, you don't know. You just talk to the OSD and it proxies it through to wherever it is. Um, so instead of, you'd be able to move from a cache tiering type model where you have sort of a sparse um, set of objects that may or may not be there in the cache tier. And if you miss, you go through the base tier to the new model where um, you go straight to the base tier, um, which is essentially an index. It, it knows what all the objects are and either if they're either there or there's a pointer to where they are. And then they can be either in you know, one slow pool or a different slow pool or wherever. Um, so it's a bit more flexible. Um, and um, it enables us to do other things. So um, deduplication is a project that the, um, the folks at SK have been working on for a while. And we've been helping out a little bit with. Um, and it's sort of built on this basic concept of a redirect. So the idea is to generalize a pointer to somewhere else with um, a manifest that says, you know, this part of the object is over in that piece, and this part of the object is over in that piece. So you can have fragments that are stored um, in other pools. Um, so we break objects into chunks. Um, we can store those chunks in content addressable pools where you, you hash the content, and so you're deduping based on the content, and then you reference count those chunks. Um, and then you can have these manifests that point to a bunch of different chunks. Um, so it's how the basic idea of how all the you know deduping storage systems work um, with you know chunking things and so on, um, but where it's scale out in the sense that, that that sort of that base Rados tier is acting as the index that says you know if this is the name of the object you look up the name in that pool and it tells you what the chunks are and where they're stored. Um, so that's that's the basic idea and that's the direction we're going in. Um, there's a lot that's sort of still to be determined. Is this going to be inline chunking and storing, or is it going to be post-processing? Is that going to happen inside the OSD or by an external agent? Is it going to be, what are the policies that are going to control when you chunk things, when you don't? These are all sort of TBD. Um, we're just sort of getting the, the core underlying functionality in place. Um, lots more work going into the Ceph manager. Um, it's sort of been built as a new place to do new stuff in Ceph. Um, and so there are a lot of things that we want to make it do. Um, one of the first things is metrics aggregation. It's already slurping up all the performance counters and all the demons into the manager, but they're not really going anywhere yet. Um, so in the short term, we want to have sort of the manager provide time series data just in memory out of the box with a, a short history, the last few minutes or whatever, so you can get a little IOPS graph without any additional work. Um, 
But eventually we'll um, want to have that stream off to external platforms. So if you have like Prometheus or Zabbix or whatever your big thing is, you can also just turn on the fire hose and send it all there. Um, so that's, that's coming. Um, it might even, it's even possible maybe that we'll get the Prometheus stuff in for Luminous, but maybe, I don't know, we'll see. Depends on how fast they are. Um, but there's also the intent of manager is that it's a, it's a good host for other management functions. So it has this whole Python runtime environment, so you can just add all these Python plugins. Um, so you can add new stuff to it pretty easily. Um, so it's going to be where we do the automatic crush optimization, where we're automatically balancing your crush, your crush weights and stuff. It'll happen out of the box. Um, but we can also do other things, like automatically identify which devices in your cluster are slow and migrate workload away from them, um, steer the I.O. away from those devices, um, or even do device failure prediction so that if we're pulling smart data off the disks, we can run a prediction model that decides which ones are about to fail and preemptively copy data off of them. <coughs> um, so lots to do there, and it's kind of exciting because it's a, there's, because you can write things in Python that are more policy-based, then it brings in a whole new pool of contributors that can, that can write that kind of code. Um, so that's good. Um, there's also stuff on the architecture front. Um, so there are ARM64 builds. I've mentioned this before, but we're still trying to get enough hardware in the lab where we can actually do these on a regular basis and get them into the CI/CD um, pipeline. Um, so we have some of the hardware. We're still waiting on a few more boxes. But um, the intent is that going forward, all of the new releases are going to have ARM64 packages for both CentOS and for um, Ubuntu. Um, there are also a bunch of patches coming in recently on PowerPC, adding support for that as well. And we're talking about getting PowerPC hardware in the community lab to do those builds. So yay power. Um, a while back, we did some work with um, ARM32 builds, because we built this um, 500 node cluster, four petabytes, out of these little microservers. It's essentially a hard disk with an ARM server on the hard disk, speaking Ethernet. So you're running the OSDs on the hard disk, literally, no boxes hosting them. That was pretty fun. Um, that was with WD Labs. And they're actually doing an update to their platform. They're doing a, that was a Gen 2 drive. They're doing a Gen 3 drive that has a 64-bit ARM. Yay, um, and more RAM and better networking and all kinds of stuff. Um, so uh, we're working with them. It's exciting. If you're interested in that project or these things seem interesting to you, you should contact um, Jim Wilshire at WDC. Um, they're looking for POC people um, to work with. So exciting, good stuff. Um, and then finally, uh, Client caching sort of across the board. So there's, um, on the Rados Gateway side, there's a project with um, Boston University and uh, Intel, I think, worked on it, um, where they added a persistent cache for Rados Gateway to support their big data workloads over RGW. Um, and they, it worked great. They're putting stuff on NVMe. They're like, saturating the NVMe. They're getting really good performance. Um, and it didn't sacrifice consistency because of the way that it was architected with. Um, they're doing immutable objects only. Um, so that was great, and the students, a couple of the students who worked on that are now interns for the summer at Red Hat, so our plan is to get all that code cleaned up and merged into the tree. So that's exciting. And on the RBD front, we're also very interested in doing um, client-side caching. If you saw um, the talk earlier with Jason and Tushar, um, we're looking both at immutable caching so that you have, if you have um, snapshots that are the basis for clones, then that, that sort of immutable parent can be cached, and then also write back cache um, so you get sort of low latency writes that then get streamed back to the cluster. Um, CephFS actually already has a persistent client-side cache if you're using the kernel client. It's been there for a while. There's a generic kernel infrastructure called FS cache that plugs into CephFS. So if you're on the CephFS side, you already have client caches, um, at least a read-only cache. It's not doesn't do written data. But um, yes, so client caches are good. Um, and that's, that's sort of it for my whirlwind tour of all the new development stuff. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about all the people who are helping us do it. Um, so these graphs are a little bit old. I didn't get updated once, unfortunately. But lots of people are contributing to Ceph. The number of contributors is increasing. We're, it's great. We love it. Um, it's, it's a challenge for us to keep up with all the pull requests and reviews. Um, so apologies if you've submitted a pull request and you feel ignored. Just keep pinging us. And we're busy, but we, we want you to keep doing it. <laughs> um, and the community um, is broadened and expanding. Um, so these are the most, um, these are the top contributors from since Jewel. Um, so it's updated a bit since my last talk. Um, but you'll see that there's sort of a broad set of people here. So you can see all of the OpenStack vendors on this list um, with the, you know, the Linux people and then EasyStack, United Stack. You see a whole bunch of cloud operators, uh, a bunch of them in, um, in APAC and, and also in Europe. Um, Public cloud, private clouds, all across the board. Um, not all of them are using OpenStack, although I think most of them are. 
Um, you also see hardware and solution vendors that are selling software products based on self, Ceph, or in some cases, hardware products based on Ceph, uh, which is very exciting. Um, people like Quantum, twice, in fact, um, that you don't usually see on these lists. Um, and a couple other people that actually I don't really know what they do. Um, I guess I could have Googled it, but, <laughs> but it's exciting. It's exciting to see the, um, the breadth, I guess, of, of contribution. So there are lots of ways to get involved. Um, there's a mailing list. Um, we do a Ceph developer monthly. So every month we have a developer video call. Um, we alternate APAC friendly and EMEA friendly times. Um, and we just talk about whatever development issues are pending. It's all virtual, IRC, whatever, so, so you can join. Um, and then if you want more events like this, of course, there are Ceph days. Um, this one's awfully convenient because it's at OpenStack Summit, but we do them all across the world, about once a month. Um, and you can go see the schedule there. The next ones are all in, um, in Asia in the next few months. There are meetups that you can search for um, in various locales. Um, we also do Ceph Tech Talks. I think this is like the last Thursday of every month or something. There's always an on, it's like a YouTube blue jeans thing um, where somebody just does some technical presentation of sub -subject on some subject related to Ceph. Those tend to be pretty interesting. All of this stuff is recorded and ends up in the Ceph YouTube channel. So if you go there, there are like hundreds of talks, recorded talks over the past many years that you can go watch and learn all kinds of good stuff. Um, and of course, you can follow us on Twitter. Yay. Um, and that's it. And don't forget to Google the Mimic Octopus because it is awesome. <laughs> um, thank you. And I'm happy to take any questions on, on Luminous, what's coming after, on old stuff, <laughs> cephalopods. <laughs> yeah, they use the microphones, though, because they're trying to record. Hi. So, yes. I have yeah. one quick question about, yeah. you know, we're really happy to see the um, work on um, QoS coming. Mm -hmm. Does that also cover, like, per client metrics in the manager? Yes, that is the intention. So the way that DM clock works, um, the M clock piece is the, the actual queue, prioritized queue that does waiting, that does both um, minimum reservations and waiting. And the D part is the distributed part. So there's metadata that's shared between IOs by the clients across OSDs. So you get a, a global reservation and not just a local one. Okay. So the intention there is that you can tag this client is going to get this reservation. And even though it's talking to lots of devices, it, it reaches that, okay. that goal. Great. But what's, again, what's missing is how you're going to configure it and how you store what the policies are and how that, that's, we have to figure that yeah, out. Yeah, we're interested in both sides of it, both being able to limit people and also being able to find the people who are abusing. Ah, uh, yes. There. So just measuring usage is yeah. one of the things, I should have mentioned that, that we want to do in manager. Okay. Um, so have the, have all the OSDs in the system sample the request streams and send that information back to the manager so they can build like a top, a top view basically of who's doing all the I.O. in the system. Okay, great, um, thanks. Yes. Do you have any plan on CPU optimization? Because now Ceph itself consumes occasionally more CPU than disks. Yes. Uh, yes, we have many plans to optimize the CPU utilization. So that's largely what the, um, the OSD refactor, one of the main things that's looking to address. Um, but also just across the board, we're doing a lot of profiling. We're trying to figure out where we're wasting CPU and data structures and whatever else that just shouldn't be done the way it does. So. Um, if you're a, if you like optimizing and profiling or whatever, then like we'd love to have you be involved. Um, but yes, there's lots of work going on there. It's def it's a known issue, <laughs> especially as the devices get faster and faster. We have to reduce the amount of CPU that we're using. Yeah. Hi. Um. Is there any uh, improved plan about the uh, uh, cross region RGW? Um. Improvements for the. Uh. uh at GW, uh, cross region. Across region. Yeah. So in Joule, the, the multi-site federation for RGW was almost completely rewritten. Yeah. Um, and so there's a whole new way to configure zones and zone groups and replication, yeah. bi-directional stuff. And there are ongoing improvements to that and bug fixes. Um, but there's no new feature per se in Luminous except for the, the metadata indexing. So. But it's, it's changed since, since Hammer and Firefly. So if that was the last time you looked at it, it's, it's newer and better and more robust and all that, yeah. Uh, two brief questions. I was wondering mm -hmm. if there's a way that we're going to be able to detect the list or the version of all the clients that are connected to a cluster? Because it's a bit hard when you're doing upgrades and if you forget one of your clients. Uh... Yep. I, I mentioned usability a couple times. We're building a Trello board with all the annoying things, and that was one of the cards I just added the other day. I think it's a simple enough thing that's going to make it into, into Luminous. Um, 
so that we can also gate changing that minimum required client on whether those clients are connected. So it'll prevent you from saying require luminous if you have hammer clients that are talking to the cluster or something. Okay. Yeah. And then the, the other thing is, is there kind of work around uh, figuring out if you have some OSDs that, for example, have high latency? Because usually those will cause a lot of issues in a cluster and are hard to find. Yes. If you're not you don't have hard infrastructure. So the, the OSDs already report um, just their sort of average latency metric to the monitor. And there's already a command called Ceph OSD perf that you can pipe the sort dash K2 and whatever, and you can, you can see it, but it's, it's annoying, you have to go do it. So one of the um, ideas is that the manager will be able to, now that it, it has all those metrics, it can do, it's, do that automatically. Yeah. And we can, you can write you know, easier to understand code in Python that just looks for the slowest OSDs and then write some policy around that, like um, set the primary affinity on those devices so that they're not primaries and so the reads go to other devices and you mitigate that, or preemptively fail them or whatever it is you want to do. That's, yes. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Any other questions? All right, thank you very much.